Well, good morning and welcome to Villiers Dorp Community Church this morning and especially to our live stream. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Trevor Vecker and it's my privilege to share with you this morning from Acts chapter 1 and verses 1 to 11. Um, if you have your Bible, please once you uh, turn there with me. And uh, if you don't have your Bible, it might be an idea just to pause this video for a moment and go get your Bible and follow along in the text with me. It really is helpful to do that. But first, let's pray as we come to God's Word. Father, we thank you so much for your Word. We ask that you would speak to our hearts now through your Word and help us to be not just hearers of your Word, but doers of your Word. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now it's estimated that there are around two and a half billion Christians in the world today. Now, just 120 years ago, the majority of Christians lived in the global north, or what is called the northern hemisphere. Since then, however, a major shift has taken place. Christianity in the northern hemisphere, in the global north, uh, began to decline. But as that decline was happening, a rapid growth was taking place in the global, global south. So much so that today the majority of Christians in the world are from the global south. And it's an amazing story. But what makes it even more amazing is how it all began. I mean, it began with a small group of people gathered around the risen Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, teaching them about the kingdom of God. And in essence, it's what Acts is all about. And it's what our text is about this morning. Now, the book of Acts, as most of you know, is Luke's second book. His first book, of course, was his gospel, Luke's gospel. Now, both books are addressed to a man or a person called Theophilus. Now, have a look at verse 1. In my former book, O Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, we, we don't know who Theophilus was. Uh, his name literally means lover of God. Um, some scholars believe that he was Luke's patron. Uh, that is, he was Luke's sponsor. Uh, I mean, in those days, uh, writing was very costly. It was extremely expensive. And if you consider that Luke's gospel, along with the book of Acts, make up about 25%, a quarter of the New Testament, well then, it would have been a very costly exercise. And so the idea of a patron, a sponsor, is entirely plausible. However, <clears throat> there are some scholars who believe that Luke's use of this name Theophilus might have been a generic way of writing to all Christians, that is to all who love God, to you and to me, to those who love God. Now one of the questions people ask is, well why is the book of Acts called the book of Acts? The Acts of what or the Acts of who? Well, traditionally, it's been known as the Acts of the Apostles, although some people see, see it as the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Now, both are true to some extent, but there's, a, there's another way of looking at the book of Acts, and that is as the Acts of the Lord Jesus. The book of Acts is a continuation. It's the sequel to the Gospel. If you remember verse 1, where Luke said that this is what Jesus began to do and to teach in the gospel. And so this is a continuation in the book of Acts. See, in the gospel, what happens is that, that Jesus is established as king, as the, the spirit-anointed king, as the Messiah. In his second book, the book of Acts, is about how Jesus' kingdom is extended, how, how his, his kingdom expands into the world. And so book one, Jesus is the king. Book two, his kingdom is extended. It's the gospel going global. And it's what we find in the first 11 verses of this chapter, and, and which uh, serve as a kind of introduction to the book of Acts. Now, for those of you who like to take notes, uh, there are three points to my outline. The first is that Jesus is the incomparable king. He's the hero, the center of the story. The second is half power, Lord. You see, it's about the global reach. 
of the gospel. The third is what I've called how long, O Lord? And it's about the duration. I mean, how long will it take? You know, some years ago, a Hillsong United came out with a, a children's song and it was called Jesus is My Superhero. It had quite a catchy tune. It was got quite a catchy tune. I mean, the chorus uh, goes something like this. Now, I'm not going to sing it for you. Uh, I don't want you to uh, hurt your ears. Uh, but let me read the words. Jesus, you're my superhero. You're my star, my best friend. Yeah, 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 yeah. Better than Spider-Man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Better than Superman. Yeah, 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 yeah. Better than Batman. And on and on this, this little song goes. Now, I'm not all that comfortable um, in comparing Jesus to a superhero, to Superman or Spider-Man or Batman. But I do get what they're saying. I mean, he, after all, it's a children's song. But, but you see, for me, Jesus is not just another superhero. Not at all. Not at all. No, he is the incomparable, the, the marvelous, the matchless king of all creation. He is magnificent, matchless. He is God in human flesh. He is the risen Christ. He rules over all creation. He holds all things together by his powerful world. word. He's our incomparable and matchless king. I mean, look at verse 1. And let's see how just incomparable he is. He's incomparable, firstly, in what he did and in what he taught. Uh, listen to what Luke says. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. You see what Luke is saying? It's all in my gospel, O lover of God. And, he, and he's saying that to you and to me. You see, are you a lover of God? Well, then Luke says, go and read my gospel and you will see just how incomparable Jesus is in what he did and in what he taught. See, he's incomparable when it comes to the signs and the wonders he performed. <clears throat> You see, he walked on water. He, he calmed the storm. He spoke to the elements, the wind and the waves. He raised the dead. He gave sight to the blind. He gave hearing to the deaf. He gave speech to the mute. I mean, in all of history, from before Christ and after, there has never and nor will there ever be anyone like him. He is incomparable. He's also incomparable in what he accomplished. I mean, Jesus Christ died for sinners. He, he died on the cross bearing our punishment, taking our penalty for our sin. He died in our place. He took our guilt. He purchased our redemption. He, he won our forgiveness. See, he's incomparable. He died on the cross for sinners. He rose again from the dead on the third day. Look at verse 3. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Many convincing proofs that he was alive. Yeah, you know, I love the summary of this gospel in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul writes, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. See, Jesus is incomparable in what he accomplished. And dear friends, this is the gospel. This is the good news that you and I share with our, our non-Christian friends. See, the story about Jesus is much, much more than just a cleverly made-up story. No, the story about Jesus is is a story that speaks to our real need. It speaks to the human condition and it, and it offers real freedom, real forgiveness, freedom from death, freedom from guilt, freedom from the wages of the penalty of sin. See, it's about a Savior who died for us and who rose again from the dead. And according to Luke, according to Luke, he gave many convincing proofs of this to his disciples. Many are witnesses to his resurrection. See, Jesus 
is incomparable in all that he accomplished. Now he's also incomparable in that he now sits at God's right hand. You see, he ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God and rules over all things. I mean, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. <clears throat> Look at verses two and three. And Jesus said, uh, or uh, Luke writes, he says, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. You see, he is incomparable. He's marvelous, the matchless king, the, the, the ascended king. He's the king who sits at God's right hand, the king of God's kingdom. Look at verse 3. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. I mean, just think about that for a moment how, and how rem remarkable that was, that would have been. This is what Jesus taught. He taught them about the kingdom of God. And what he, what he taught them must, of course, be understood in connection with Luke's gospel. It comes within the context of Luke's gospel. And especially chapter 24 of the gospel where Luke says that after his resurrection, Jesus taught his disciples that, that all of scripture is about him. See, all of scripture pointed to him as the long-awaited Messiah, as the king of of God's kingdom as the risen king. I mean, friends, this is our gospel. This is the good news that we share with our uh, non-Christian friends. You know, what is really tragic is that their hope is really only in this world. And the world, when we look at it today, is, is in the process of unraveling. When the war, for example, in Ukraine is, is I think, far bigger than we even imagine. See, the kingdoms of this world are in the process of being, of being shaken, even as we speak. But you see, our hope is in another world. It's in an everlasting kingdom, an unshakable kingdom. So Jesus is incomparable. He is also incomparable when it comes to his matchless gift. Have a look at verses 4 and 5. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this, this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, and which you have heard me speak about. And then look at verse 5. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, dear friends, I personally believe that we cannot overestimate the significance of the, the coming of the Holy Spirit into the world. The coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost literally divides a human history into two epochs, the age of the law and the age of the spirit. And it's important for us to read the book of Acts with that context in mind. Acts, as it were, tracks the transition between these two epochs, these two ages, the age of the law and the age of the spirit. And we see this transition in the book of Acts taking place in, the, in the, uh, the stories of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on different groups of people. First at Pentecost upon the Jews, and then later on upon the Samaritans, and then later on upon the Gentiles. See, it's the age of the Spirit. That is what we are meant to gain from those stories. And what we, had, what we actually discover is that all believers now are baptized with the Holy Spirit. God by His Spirit lives in us. And it happened the moment you believe the gospel. You are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, in speaking of this, says we are all made to drink of the one Spirit. And so Jesus is incomparable. He's the matchless, incomparable, marvelous, risen, exalted King. He's incomparable in what He did. He's incomparable in what he taught. He's incomparable in what he accomplished. He's also incomparable in his matchless gift. See, it's this story, this gospel of the incomparable Jesus that goes global. Now, obviously raised uh, uh, an obvious question with the disciples. You see, would this epochal event 
the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, would it bring about the restoration of the kingdom to, to Israel? It, it, it was an obvious question for a Jew to ask. And I've called it how, how far, O Lord. And it's the second point in my outline. Verse 6, so when they met, met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And notice here, I believe they get two things wrong in their question. First of all, their focus, and then secondly, their timing. I mean, as to their timing, I mean, they imagined that it was going to happen immediately. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, they were wrong in that, weren't they? I mean, look at verse 7. He said to him, it's not for you to know the times and the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. And how often haven't you heard people predict the return of the Lord Jesus? I mean, there have been so many, haven't there? It's been a cause of much embarrassment, I believe, for the church. You know, I remember how I was caught up in the excitement uh, in the 1970s uh, by a book called The Late Great Planet Earth by, by a guy called Hal Lindsey. And I was, so, I was so disappointed when he didn't return. You might have heard of someone called Harold Camping. I mean, he was a, a fundamentalist preacher from, the, from America as well. He was obsessed with the end of the world. And he spoke about it endlessly on his radio program. He predicted that the world would end in September the, the 6th, 1994. Uh, when that didn't happen, well, he did what all these people do, don't they? They just give you another date. They postponed. And so in, in 2011, he then raised $100 million. I mean, get your head around that figure. $100 million for a campaign to convince the world that it was going to end on the 21st of May of 2011. Well, the Lord had still not returned when Harold Camping finally died, aged 92, in 2013. I personally wondered what happened with the money, but, but that is by the way. But more importantly, see, what, what made him ignore the clear teaching of Scripture? Verse 7 should really put an end to all the silliness of these kinds of predictions. Listen to it again, so that you'll be able to answer any kind of outlandish claim about when Jesus will return. Verse 7, he said to him, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. See, they got their timing wrong. But notice how they also got their focus wrong. It seems that the disciples believed that, that the incomparable Jesus was just for Israel. Look at verse 6. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? See, was the Messiah, the, 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 the matchless king, the spirit-anointed king, was he just for Israel? Was the kingdom going to be for Israel? And that was an important question for them. See, is God going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, Christians have fought over this for ages. There's a great difference of opinion. And the answer is a bit nuanced. And so let me rephrase that question for you and think about it for a moment. Lord, that is Father, was Jesus sent just for the nation of Israel? I mean, the answer is obvious, isn't it? Look at how Jesus answers that question. No, not at all. In fact, Jesus says that the gospel must go global. Verse 6, or no, verse 8, sorry. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. See, the incomparable Jesus, the, the Spirit-anointed King, is for the world. The kingdom of God. The story, the message of the kingdom must go out to the world. See, the gospel must go global. You know, now I mentioned that there's a bit of nuance to this, and here it is. The kingdom will be restored to Israel. I believe that. But what I believe is that, the, that Israel is redefined by Jesus, or in Jesus. You see, Jesus is the true Israelite. He is the true Israel, and all those who are united to him through faith, whether Jew or Gentile, 
now belong to Israel, are now the true Israel. So I firstly don't believe in replacement theology. Now I believe in fulfillment theology. It's all fulfilled in him, the true Israelite. And so how far, Lord? Well, you must take the story of this matchless king, this Jesus, to the ends of the earth. And you must invite everyone to come in. And that brings me to my final point. How long, O oh Lord? How long will the mission last and when will it end? And the answer is found in verses 9 to 11. Listen to what it says. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him going to heaven. See how long, O oh Lord? Well, it's going to last until he returns. That is when our mission will finally end. It ends when Jesus come back, comes back again. And it's what I was reminded of when I watched the, the live stream last Sunday to, to our service. See, every live stream at Villiers Top Community Church begins with our mission statement. We love God, we love His Word, we love His Church, and we love His mission. See, we love His mission. It means we are committed here at Villiers Top Community Church to telling the good news about Jesus, about the incomparable King, to our fallen world. What that means is that you and I need to just get on with the job together as a church. And if I may borrow an illustration I heard some time ago, um, and that is uh, we, we must be mindful of the, the angel's rebuke in, verses, in verse 11. Look at what they say. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? In other words, what are you doing? You've been given a task, so get on with it. What are you doing looking to the sky? You see, sky gazing is not going to save the world. Listen to your Lord. Go and wait in Jerusalem for the gift of the Holy Spirit. He will empower you to take the Jesus story, the gospel, the good news of your incomparable Savior into the world. And that's how the gospel went global. And it's why there are now two and a half billion Christians in the world today. In fact, it's why you and I are here today. This is why we are gathered in church. We are here because of the eyewitness account of these early disciples. That's where it began. It began with them. And, and so this passage is, is not primarily about you and me, not at all. Now it's about them, then us, taking the story of the incomparable Jesus into the world. And it's why we are here today. See, we believe the story they took into the world. They were the eyewitnesses. They heard what he taught. They saw what he did. They saw the risen Christ. And, and, and what they taught us and what they spoke, we heard. We hear it through the text of Scripture. It's what we have in our Bibles. See, this is their gospel. And do you remember what Jesus said to Thomas? I mean, Thomas only believed after he had put his hand into Jesus' sight. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Dear friends, this is you and me. We have not seen and yet we have believed. We didn't see, you see, but we did hear. And what we heard, what we heard was the gospel. And the gospel calls for the same response, the same response that Thomas had when he saw and heard. And that is to believe, to put your trust in the, in the incomparable Jesus who died for your sins and who rose in power from the dead. See, believe and you will be saved. And dear friends, that message is true for you and me today as it is for our world. And so I want to end just with this little thought, is that this text is about our Lord Jesus Christ. It's about our King, our risen King, 
our exalted king, our incomparable king, incomparable in what he did, in what he taught, in what he achieved, and in his matchless gift, incomparable in everything. And his mission, his command is for you and for me to go into the world and take his story, the story about him dying for sinners on the cross, into a fallen and broken world, a world that is desperately in need of this message. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. We just pray that you'd help us, Lord, uh, to take this word into the world. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.